and we're off. Brothers, sisters, siblings, welcome to Penn Sunday School, starring Penn Gillette. My name is Michael Doe, Matt, Freddie Rich, Penn and I are broadcasting from our separate homes in Las Vegas. Today is another episode with the author of Mezzanine and Human Smoke, the beginning of World War II and the end of civilization, and the amazing book we were all reading recently, Baseless. The great Nicholson Baker is with us here again. Here he is preaching love, Mr. Penn Gillette. And I'm going to jump right into what I don't want to jump into, but you uh, you uh, you uh, hinted at it twice during the last show. I'm going to make you talk about it now. Our friend, Dr. Greger, who is an epidemiologist uh, and also a vegan, um, points to our factory farming and uh, gathering together of other species in um, – very unsanitary, unpleasant environments and close to us for making diseases hop across, uh, zoonotic, uh, diseases to become human, uh, diseases. And now we are in the, uh, uh, maybe at best middle, uh, maybe closer to the beginning of a pandemic. And, uh, uh, You've written a lot about diseases. How much uh, do you feel that what we're going through now may be um, may be the result of uh, of human tinkering? Well, in some ways, I'm, I'm the wrong person to ask because I have just written a book in which there are laboratory diseases all over the place, and American scientists trying to come up with weapons that would attack an enemy. Um, end up creating problems in their own laboratories. People found that there was anthrax on the, on the drinking fountain, on the pedal of the drinking fountain. It's something that, uh, happens is American scientists get sick, um, when they study diseases. So, and this is a problem that is, it's permanent. It's not, it doesn't have to, I mean, science, the science of diseases is, astonishing and new recombinant work is amazing tricky things that you can do with genes but people are people and people make mistakes people drop things lab animals bite people so um, uh, d mistakes have been happening in american laboratories since there were laboratories and they, that continues people are new hires are untrained you know so we're in the middle of the worst health catastrophe of of uh, ever really in our in our memories right and I, I've just written this book in which people are getting sick from all kinds of diseases that they've cooked up so of course my first thought was is there a laboratory there I mean you know is there and and lo and behold there was a lab there were two laboratories there was there was a laboratory with a level four brand new. And so they were just moving into a new building. That's when errors happened. And there's a level two laboratory. I don't think, though. And then we're also doing contract work for the United States. Um, I think the only thing that you can say with any certainty right now is we must look at a laboratory. It's. It, I think it's sort of like if if there's a crime and a and a and a, a woman is killed. One of the first suspects is the husband, right? That's basically the one of the first suspects. If there is a gigantic, expensive new laboratory in a city, and it a very astonishingly uh, specific new disease has just broken out in that city, one of the th places that you must investigate right away is that laboratory. The bizarre thing is that there's been this effort to basically undermine anyone who says that that's um, that that should happen by saying it's a conspiracy theory and the reason is because the Trump administration is just an anthology an encyclopedia of conspiracy theories they are just cooking up ridiculous crap all the time and because of that uh, 
the fact that <laughs> real crap is hard to identify. <laughs> it, it just it's just made it impossible to do science. The way you the way you investigate a disease is you act like a scientist, and a scientist says, "Where might this disease have come from?" It's a disease that's very similar to a certain bat disease. The bat disease was found and sampled and genetically sequenced in a laboratory in Wuhan. And this new disease that is, is now ravaging the world and tearing up people's lungs is a disease that's very related to a, a, a disease that was in the freezer in this laboratory. Well, it's at least worth asking if that isn't just a, biz a bizarre coincidence. It's a, it, of course you want to do the science. I mean, this, it's just absurd to say that it's a conspiracy theory. It's just a theory. It's just a possibility. It's not that it's a way, it should never be a way of saying the Chinese are bad and we should, um, you know, we should demonize them or in because actually it was a gigantic if it is something that came from the Wuhan laboratory it's a gigantic collaboration between American scientists who figured out how to do all this crazy gene splicing so-called gain of function research and the scientists around the world that they were hiring to do some of the research I just can't not think, having just written about so many lab accidents, I can't just think to myself, this is, the laboratory in Wuhan is, is pristine, it couldn't possibly be the source of any disease, because that wouldn't be right, that wouldn't be scientific. I mean, I'm not, not that I'm a scientist, but that would, that would, that's just not reasonable. I think you're, you're, you're pointing to something very distinct that conspiracy theories lack, which is just clumsiness and human error, that doing things on a large scale creates accidents. And I think the hard part about when you hear conspiracy theories is that it is a definitive authority for, you know, diabolical gain is why right. you would invent. Uh, um, With intent. Yeah. With intent, right. There's no intent. But there was no intent to make people in China sick, no intent to make the entire world sick. If this is true, it was that they were doing a, an experiment with the uh, amping up, the turning up the dial on a disease in order to make it more infectious to humans, in order to f work on vaccines for that potential disease. It was a, it was actually a well-intentioned effort, and it was funded by the United States under the Trump administration. The Trump administration said yes. Go ahead and do this. So if we're going to blame any American president, we have to blame Donald Trump for creating the situation that would have led to this brand new laboratory in China doing a risky experiment that was that went wrong, if that happened. Now, I'm not saying it did happen. We also know that it's very unlikely that he would have read the documents to give the okay to that. Hmm. We know that, uh, yes. I mean, it would, under his watch, but mm -hmm. you know, there's probably one president who's read everything handed to him, and that's Obama. I don't think anyone else has done the level of homework that's really required to be president. And Trump, I believe, has done the least of the homework. So, but what's so soul crushing about this is we have the team sports have been set up so strongly mm -hmm. that when um, Trump says it could be out of a laboratory in China, automatically half the country says absolutely not. It's, you know, it's a nat natural cause. And to be able to cross those battle lines intellectually is so difficult, mm -hmm. so difficult. It is. In fact, I don't know that it's possible. Right now, people are dying from this disease. And I know from, from writing about wars is that rationality just goes completely out the window. Right now, we're in a war. We're in, we're in a, the situation of immense threat against people. So the, nobody is going to think rationally right now about this particular, this, this pandemic. So um, it doesn't, 
I, I just, I don't know what to say actually about this. I mean, I, I, I feel that, uh, <laughs> um, I have a strong suspicion that something went wrong there, but I just, I mean, I, I don't even want to say it because it, even saying it seems to open up some kind of avenue of, uh, of, of out of context politicization that, yeah. that makes it, you know, so I just basically have avoided writing about it. You made it very, very clear that you are a man with a hammer and you are seeing nails. I mean, you've just finished the, the book that would make you look at that laboratory, but uh, you, you make a, you make a wonderful, although measured case. I don't think you've said anything that's, um, that's, that's wrong at all. I think that the, the case you made was, was, was very, very measured. And, uh, I don't want to, uh, and will not, you know, push you further. Um, because looking into it is what we want. Doesn't it seem, I mean, we know from reading your book that the most likely explanation is that a contractor used the wrong piece of tubing somewhere. You know what I mean? It's not that someone planned this or released it, or it's, it's that they just fucked it up. They built it wrong. And so it's instead of flushing the toilets, it's shooting into the yard. You know what I mean? Well, <laughs> it's, that's because it was a new building, you mean. Yeah. Well, take a, take a look at a recent, a recent uh, now because the virus is, is all over the place, there's all this money to study the virus. So at the University of North Carolina, um, the, which has been studying bat coronaviruses for something like 15 years and has done some of the most amazing, impressive, and really breathtakingly risky experiments on the planet without, without mishap. Somebody was, uh, holding an experimental animal. I think it was a rat and the, the animal bit through the person's glove. So they reported it. This is a, a, a lab error at the premier coronavirus laboratory in the United States. I mean, this is the place that cooked up all of the research about how to tinker with these genetic sequences. And there was an error there. The error was because, you know, something went wrong. An animal bit through somebody's glove. The person didn't get sick. There was no, no fallout. But if it can happen there, it can happen anywhere, basically. That's, it's just, it's, it's just a, it's a fact of life. If you've got experimental animals, you've got you've got crap around, you've got cages, you've got animals that are just literally batshit crazy because they've been <laughs> kept, you know, in, in confinement. It's very hard to keep bats, live bats, very, very difficult to keep them alive. I mean, l just look at the possibilities. <laughs> what was going on, what is going on in, on this planet right now is that very uh, strange concoctions of viruses are being FedExed all over the place to different laboratories in order to study them. And what went on before this is that different samples, anal samples and bat guano samples from all over the place were brought back to certain laboratories in order to be sequenced and studied. So you pull stuff that was never been looked at before and never had any human contact before people going into caves that have never been visited before, you have it all concentrated in one case. One scientist um, I, I talked to said, is that a good idea, you know, to uh, to bring back all, all those weird, weird bat diseases and pangolin diseases and civet diseases and everything, bring them all back to one lab? And he said, no, it's like looking for a gas leak with a lighted match. Oof. That's a good analogy. Yeah. And I think it's just, yeah, I think one of the um, overwhelming things about your book is that, like, normally when someone's going to break down these particular operations, these particular experiments, you want bad guys, right? And so you you already, in the last podcast, spoke with such humanness about these pursuits. You keep, I keep, want, I kept reading, wanting there to be a central figure <laughs> or wanting there to be a central time period. You know, right, right. Yeah. and it's just overwhelming that we will, as humans or, or Americans, like can continue these, someone will pick up the baton, someone will pick up the torch, somebody will have a curiosity driven towards this 
Um, I mean, these, you constantly, these, you know, the Pandora's box analogy, constantly trying to find these crazy things that will crack open um, something awful. It's, if we don't really, do it, somebody else will. Right. And, and the idea is, um, what is an emerging disease? An emerging disease is a disease that doesn't exist, but might emerge. So how do you find an emerging disease is by tinkering with the genetics of it to make it an emerging disease. So it's, as one scientist said, it's a, it's, it's like firebugs who are fascinated, you know, who set fires in order to put them out. It's, it's a way of, of looking at something with fascination and proving to the world how dangerous it is by messing with it. And it's, it's a very dangerous game. And, and, that, and, and a whole bunch of scientists back during the Obama administration said, this is ridiculous. Don't cook up horrible things in laboratories and make bad diseases worse because it's nuts. Okay. Stop. <laughs> and they had a whole, they had a whole, uh, um, it was essentially a petition, but it was called a statement. It was signed by Nobel laureates and people all over the place. No more so-called gain of function, which means making it jump from an experimental animal to a human research. Don't do it, except if you're going to do extremely tight risk-reward analysis. So they did that, and the Obama administration put a, a hold on it. And then in the last days of the Obama administration, they said, well, okay, maybe we should resume. And then, of course, in the Trump administration, it's like drilling for Arctic oil or all the other stuff that Trump does, you know, let's, it's, it's a, let's just, let's just go with it. Let's just do it. So gain of function research got a big boost in 2018 from the Trump administration. So it's just, uh, I don't know. I, I did not know that at all. That's the most damning evidence you've presented. Uh, only because this president seems obsessed with undoing every single thing the last president did. It seems to be like the primary function of his uh, agenda. Now, 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 Matt, to put the attention a little bit more on uh, on Nicholson, while he had his headphones off, you asked you asked a question that was really good that I want you to ask Nicholson. Okay. Um, so as you get into these um, these FOIA requests, freedom of information requests, right, right? You started like meeting people whose lives kind of seemed dedicated to chasing down these FOIA requests. Yeah. Um, when did you go to uh, observing them uh, being one of these kinds of people to you becoming one of these kinds of people? And when did you realize it happened? <laughs> that is a good question. And there were two guys in particular I really liked. They were two Canadian historians who had written about the Korean War. One, his dad had said, the Chinese are, are drop. Uh, it's true what the Chinese are saying. The Americans are dropping bugs on the Chinese, and that's bad. And, and these two guys I got to know, and they had, they, the one of them, Ned Hagerman, was a real virtuoso at, at, at well, at being patient, but at, at getting secrets out by re iteratively sending more and more letters saying, yes, continue with the, continue with the declassification. In some cases, he waited 10 years for documents. And both of them amassed this parallel collection of thousands of pages. And I was really impressed by their willingness to wait. You have to wait a long time, and then you have to deal with thousands of pages of stuff. that, And you have to kind of go through it all and process it and make sense of it. Um, learn the names of the people. Learn the secretaries that who typed the documents. You have to live with the documents, and 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 I so I started to do that first with their help, and then on my own I went to the National Archives and did it, and then I realized that there were people who would who were so far beyond me in this. There are people who've made thousands and thousands of FOIA requests. Um, there's a guy named Ravnitsky who's just tireless, and there's a person at the at the National Security Archive, William Burr, who just every Every day, every week, he is waiting for something to come back, but he's putting something in. So it's just sort of like he's feeding this uh, feedback loop. And most of the time, what comes back is a refusal. 
but sometimes you because there's such variation in in declassifying sometimes somebody lets something out and and it's, it's in one case William Burr suddenly got this document that was was a uh, atomic war plan uh, that that listed all of the ground zeros in every one of the uh, enemy countries, including, I think there were 17 ground zeros in Beijing, and there were ground zeros in Saigon. They were going to basically blitz the entire communist world with atomic bombs. And he, he had the actual cities. Somebody sent him this computer printout. So it's a huge sort of a, a step forward in that we know more about the specifics of it. But it takes years of effort, and I don't have, I can't do that. I am impatient. I, I want to write what I know and be done with it. And I, you know, this book, I've been working on this book, waiting for seven years or eight, I guess eight years now for documents, and I just can't wait anymore. So I, I, I ended up writing about the waiting because that was yeah. all I, you know, because the waiting turns out to be part of what I thought was a sort of form of psychological warfare, in a way, against history, against historians. How hard is it not to write the snotty letter? How hard is it not to curse on these requests? <laughs> well, there used to be, uh, back in, in the early days of Apple, there was a, uh, Apple was advertising how their word processing program was so good at at editing and they had they would show the initial letter which was you know dear shit for brains you fucking asshole why are you doing this to me <laughs> and then they had all the cross outs and everything and um and that's what i do mentally i mean i think you know <laughs> first of all the the person the the person who's getting the letter also is just an employee and they, right. they in fact one guy called me up and said hey i noticed you uh, are asking for march 24th and May 24th in the same document. And just please help me out here. It's from the CIA. Could you please tell me whether you mean March 24th or May 24th? I said, wow, you know, yes, I, I meant, I meant May 24th. And I, I hung up and said to my wife, you know, CIA just called to check a date. <laughs> <You know? laughs> they wanted to I make sure it. they weren't sending you the right thing. <laughs> yeah, of course. What, what? Once I got it, I realized they're still not giving up anything. They still the redactions are all there. All the juicy stuff has been whited out. Damn it! But um, but it's but it was it was a it was a an illustration of the fact that nobody nobody outside of you know Batman movies is is. Uh, is an enemy in that way. Is it? Is an evil genius? No, there's none of that. It's all just people sitting in offices trying to get through the day, you know, sipping a little coffee. It's. It's. We have to get get to the fact that the mistakes are are structural, are sort of deep in in thinking, rather than something that's manifested by some sort of uh, you know s s some sort of costume, some sort of strange way of speaking. I was fascinated by the section where you said the uh, Russian information was better than what you could get from your own government. And it was. It was absolutely. And I found that over and over again. The Russians had a lot of agents in, and uh, they were willing, and they published, you know, they would say, in Iran, there are now people agitating, or in, in East Germany. And it was absolutely true. But of course, the American idea was to was plausible deniability and and so these the state department would deny things that really i mean the 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 level of just shameless denial for decades is amazing to me i i guess that's what i i didn't understand is the ability to lie straightforwardly and to and to enlist the press in your lies because sometimes as James Reston said, I quote him saying, what's so disturbing as a journalist is that, that a journalist will have to publish something that he knows to be untrue. And that's because the, the CIA has gotten involved in, in, in dark operations. And that's, that shouldn't be allowed. It's, that's a problem.
Is that wall of secrecy normal for historians or is that just an artifact of this period in time? Like if you were living in the Crusades and you wanted to find out about your side, could you find it out from the enemy better? Yeah, I think that's probably a good, I think that's a good point. You can always find out the, the bad points of your own actions from the enemy better than from your own people. <laughs> of course. And, <laughs> and the, but the, but the, uh, the, uh, unusual thing about the period from 1948 to say 1990 was that, uh, through the Reagan administration and beyond is that, um, that there was an entire bureaucracy a real huge thousands of people devoted to figuring out ways to do things that were disinformation and, and, and stealth. And so that was, that's a new thing is I don't think there's ever been, even in the worst excesses of the czarist regime, has there been an agency? Well, I guess you could say that, 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 the, that the Russian Secret Service and the British Secret Service were both uh, models, but I think that the American clandestine arm of the, not the smart scholarly CIA, the people who pipe smokingly write long papers about the Guatemalan economy that obviously presidents don't read, but that are there, not those people, but the people in the clandestine units who are training commandos and dropping into that part was new and that is something that the second half of the 20th century imposed on the world that i think is was new to history and we're still dealing with the results of that um that kind of that, that action i'm going to uh do a one quick ad here and then i want to uh i think talk a little bit about uh human smoke another uh very bothersome <laughs> Nicholson <laughs> book. But first, I'm going to tell you about HelloFresh. Offers convenient delivery right to your doorstep for easy home cooking with a family. Recipes are easy to follow and quick to make with simple steps and pictures to guide you along the way. HelloFresh cuts out stressful meal planning and grocery store trips so you can enjoy cooking and get dinner on the table in about 30 minutes or even less. You can save 40% off by using HelloFresh versus shopping at your local grocery store, and it's more convenient too. HelloFresh's gourmet recipes, like their balsamic fig sirloin, over 60% cheaper than the average meal out, so you can enjoy a restaurant-quality dinner for less. It's delicious and it's nutritious. Uh, Godot, you eat these all the time. I love them. There's something for everyone. Low-calorie, vegetarian, kid-friendly options. Uh, the food is pre-proportioned, so you're not overbuying, which is the burden on the planet. Uh, the packaging of HelloFresh uses to ship your food is almost entirely made from recyclables and or already recycled content. Um, it's flexible for your lifestyle. Keep your fridge stocked. We add extra proteins or sides like garlic bread in your weekly order. Easily change your delivery days or food preferences. Skip a week whenever you need. And HelloFresh is committed to making fresh, delicious food available now more than ever. It has taken extra steps to keep its employees and customers safe, including contactless delivery, tamper-proof packaging, and team member wellness checks. Donated over 2.5 million meals to charity in 2019. Um, uh, we just, it's a great company. Uh, go to hellofresh.com slash 80 pen and use the code 80 pen, 80 pen, 80 P E N N. Get a total of $80 off. Your first month, $80 off first month is really good, including free shipping on your first box. Additional restrictions apply. Please visit HelloFresh.com for more details. HelloFresh.com slash 80 pen. That's H zero P E N N. Now, you know, uh, I've always been, uh, I think because of my age, but also other stuff, I've always been a, a piece of dick. And I've always had this um, nagging feeling, and something I've even said, that, um, well, we want to stay away from war, and pacifism is probably the answer, but World War II, we probably did the right thing. Uh, that was always the hype, I believe, that Korea and Vietnam, they were really bad ideas. World War I was really fucked up. 
World War II, we went in and saved a lot of uh, people that needed saving. Hello, smoke. I'm hello, smoke. (laughs) Cuban smoke. (laughs) War crimes fresh to your door. (laughs) Kind of blows that completely away. Did you start out a complete pacifist from writing Human Smoke, or did that come to you? You should also tell you what Human Smoke is. It's yeah. It's mostly other people's words. Yeah. You yeah. mostly curate and go in order to the reports of the early parts of World War II with the most powerful editorializing I've ever seen, which is the almost complete lack of editorializing. Well, gosh, thank you. That is That was the idea, was just, let's see what we can, and that was the dog, by the way. The dogs feel it's dinner time, so there's going to be some pulling on power cords and stuff here, but um, um, I didn't know. I mean, I remember thinking when I would, I, 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 was, I took no history classes in high school because I went to an experimental high school. I took no history classes in college. Um, So I'm completely self-taught. And I thought, well, this, you know, I could see that that there was never a worse person in history than this man in charge of the Axis in Germany. Um, I could see that terrible things were happening. I just don't understand why there was all this flying over armies and then dropping bombs on cities i remember thinking that that's the, that's the only thought i had was this just this perplexity why was that the strategy to to if you disagree with a country's policy uh and you are a traditional army you then fight that army and you have a ritualistic boss battle you know with the enemy but what churchill's idea was you fly over the enemy army and you drop bombs on the place that the army isn't, where people are living, where the where the civilians are living, who may or may not agree with the politics of the administration. So I thought, well, that's just weird. So I did. I guess I wrote the book in order to find out what really happened and who said what at what point. Were there smart people at the time, thoughtful people who were saying there is another way? There's another way to deal with the threat of Germany and the threat of Japan than the way we dealt with them. And what's the, what, what, I guess, it, I thought there was a use in going, in, in looking at a war not as a, a gigantic umbrella construct, but as a sequence of individual, pers- very personal decisions by people to do one thing or another thing. I wanted to sort of atomize or particularize the the war, and that's and I ended up I just found that the best source was really the newspaper. There were newspaper articles, and speeches, diaries, the things that people said privately to themselves. I just I just used them, and I I wasn't consciously making an um, an argument, but the more I looked into it, the more I found that the people who were pacifists that had become pacifists during the First World War or were pacifists even before the First World War and had been conscientious objectors were were more often saying things that made sense to me. And so I quoted them and I felt that I, I felt that some of the, what they were doing was kind of was brave and heroic and uh, had not been paid attention to. So the idea was to write a history of the beginning of World War II that allowed in the possibility that there ha- was a different way to deal with this horrific threat from Germany. Now, you, you, uh, you made me think which was saying something, because I thought about it a lot before, but you made me think so much more about pacifism. And uh, that is a tool. And, of course, from um, uh, Steven Pinker's book and now this uh, new book, Humankind, that's out, Mm -hmm. we find out that um, if you had no morality whatsoever, 
if you just wanted your revolution to be as successful as possible and you did not care about human life, mm -hmm. turns out Mandela and Martin Luther King are still the fellas to follow, which is so shocking yeah. that, um, that, that, that peace works, um, that nonviolence works. Uh, right. Even Obama's acceptance speech for the Nobel Prize, uh, there's a part of it that troubles me where he kind of says, well, you know, Martin Luther King did these wonderful things, but he's almost a special case. And um, the, the, as I said, the Pinker book and Humankind really make this really um, cold-hearted assessment that pacifism may be sensible, even if you don't care about killing people, mm -hmm. which is an incredible caveat to put to, to mm -hmm. pacifism. Mm -hmm. And I just wonder, uh, after uh, Baseless and, uh, and Human Smoke, where you've come down on pacifism. How far can it be taken? And I'm just talking about you personally now. Yeah. Well, I think it's very difficult. You know, what, what is always the, the counter argument, if, if you set aside World War II, the counter argument is always what if somebody is attacking your family? And my feeling is I would, of course, fight just like everybody else would. I would, I mean, I, I, I'm not a pacifist in the sense that I think that I'm going to just simply not resist some threat to my personal loved unit of life. But what pacifism, that the kind of pacifism that I subscribe to believes is that armies, giant kind of uh, institutionalized mechanisms of of group slaughter is are, is it don't it's not fair to use the same threat model as what would somebody do with your family when you're dealing with gigantic armies you're talking about something that is totally different and in that case I think it's never a good idea <laughs> to fight. To, I think it's almost always a better idea to allow an invader into your country, especially if they're numerically superior, and, uh, than to uh, to fight to the last man to keep them out. Always better to capitulate. Um, but in this case, it wasn't that. That's not what was at issue with the Second World War. What what Churchill wanted to do was fight a war of attrition. He wanted a very long war. Now imagine, um, imagine that you have um, a floor full of people who are being held prisoner, hostage, hostage situation, um, and you say this is uh, uh, unacceptable, and and these are our enemies. So we're gonna now we're gonna we're gonna now gradually. Uh, set fire to the building. Many fires, in fact, not just one fire, but many fires. Is that is is the way to save the hostages? In this case, it was Jews and other powerless minorities in Germany were the hostages by setting fire to the building to Germany. Is that the way? Is that by having a long war of attrition? Is that gonna? Is that actually gonna save anybody? Of course not. The only thing that's gonna save. The Jews, in this case, was the thing that the pacifists, uh, people, the Catholic worker, people who were who had, uh, who were who had been arguing on behalf of peace for a long time, said the way to save the Jews of Europe is by negotiating right now, by uh, pause in the fury of hostilities right now, and let's let everybody calm down, and then we will deal with whatever massive population movements um, can happen. And then, if we want to go back to war, okay. But let's get the irrational element out of it. Let's have a ceasefire, and then people can escape who want to escape. And then, if you want to go back to fighting, okay. But what? But that was not ever possibly possible to take up, because actually the appetite was for a war to the end, a, a, a kind of a an, a true Armageddon battle was was what was happening, and it was happening via building these bombers that had unpresent you know thousands of 
bombing planes was the was the proposed solution to this thing. Um, it's just, and, and then it happened in Germany. I mean, it happened in Japan. I mean, suddenly you think, well, we've destroyed the Japanese Air Force. What will we do? We can fly low and set fire to every city we, can, we have on the map. You know, um, is that, what's, how is that in any way a good, I mean, it's just not a good idea. It's wrong. It's just terribly wrong. And I guess I want to re rescue the primitive feeling that some things are just simply horrifyingly wrong. I want to read uh, to that a, um, you know, one thing we, we haven't done is talked about what a fabulous uh, writer you are on the detail level. This uh, few sentences, just a few sentences from your book, uh, this is from Baseless, just, just stop me dead. The mistake is to convince young men of 18 or 20 that their selfless, eager, almost puppyish desire to be admired is worth ending their lives for. It's not. Oof. So uh, someone else asked a question after that. those two sentences have destroyed me. <laughs> uh, even simple <laughs> sentences that were just like, you're, you have to say, every, every dog has a novel inside them. <laughs> um <laughs> Just came at the conclusion of like uh, observing the very dogs we're listening to right now. Um, um, well, such a beautiful conclusion. Uh, thank you. It's it's thank it's you. it's it's so perfectly written. You don't need um, anything else. And that happened, guys. Please relax. Okay, it's going to come. <laughs> um, the the I went. I I just I wanted wow. to write in different places in this book. So I parked in the graveyard, and I saw them. With leaf blowers, this team of five guys blowing all the leaves, and the leaves were just in this kind of wave, golden wave over all the gravestones, and this absolutely absurd craziness of, of, of you know these. Why would we send people off to do that when and and kind of cheat them of their lives, but also trick them into thinking that heroically dying is a good thing. I mean, it's just because the generals, the generals who are all doing that have all survived. They're the survivors. They're the crafty ones, not the ones who did, died in Okinawa or wherever. So anyway, I just want to thank you for for, seeing, for noticing that, that phrase and for noticing the phrase about the dog. Every dog has a novel. It's the uh, uh, be a leaf tumbling and leaping around a gravestone. Don't be a gravestone. Exactly. Uh, it's I yeah well I <laughs> I believe that um, I believe it and the, and the, and I and I I feel that it's worth saying even though I know people are, I know some people roll their eyes and say oh you know that this is overly simplistic or anything but that book that you that that last book that you were talking about that that shows that. Nonviolence oh. is actually more of the time more successful than violence. That it gets results is a powerful thing to keep in mind. Is is that actually is that uh, the movements since since f all, all through the second half of the twentieth century, the movements that wanted to attain a political end, the movements that were nonviolent got results more than the movements that were violent. That's a that, powerful thing to know. That's an incredible piece of information. And I don't believe that piece of information to, to say that um, Martin Luther King and Mandela were, were pragmatists, <laughs> you know, is, a, is, a, is just an incredible, incredible piece of information. I've also, and I guess this is very oversimplified, but if a group of minorities is not wanted by their government, and another government says that uh, oppressing those people is wrong, mm -hmm. then it seems like the best answer possible is come on over. Yeah. I've always wondered, why isn't Israel in Arizona? We've mm -hmm. got some fucking desert. <laughs> <laughs> There were, there were there were proposals to have have so-called you know set aside lands, but that but it was not acceptable to the Roosevelt administration. Yeah, who they hadn't they considered um, Tasmania? No, um, 
Madagascar. Madagascar. No, but also I think they also considered uh, Tasmania. And they also considered, I mean, rewriting the world so that, you know, Hitler comes along and says, uh, we don't want Jews. And America says, okay, we'll take them. Seems to be our country just gets better. I'm reading a, a, a book right now uh, by David Swanson called Leaving World War II Behind. And it, the, point, the whole purpose of the book is to, is to say, you know, everyone thinks that World War II is a special case. You may be against wars in general, but this is the one. But he shows sort of systematically, chapter by chapter, it wasn't fought on behalf of the Jews. It, the, you know, one question after another he sort of deals with and it's really a powerful way of, of I think, making a case for, you know, good sense and, and just re a reasonable approach. And, and maybe the whole specter of Churchill's greatness can be moderated. It might not be that he's thought of as a, as a terrible man, but he's now thought of as the greatest politician of the 20th century, when in fact he was the person who was most responsible for two two and a half ferociously devastating wars. I mean, he was, he was a cheerleader for World War I, which was, and then he, and then he was a tremendous lengthener and exacerbator of World War II. So maybe we can put him aside and say, he's not the hero we thought he was. Let's look at some other heroes who look, who had a, who were saying things at the time. Well, the good news is that it certainly is going in this direction. You know, there, yeah. there, there are fewer terrorist attacks, fewer murders, fewer deaths. Uh, no matter how much the politicians are selling fear, the facts are just not behind them. Right. Um, things, things are getting better and coming along. And uh, boy, it's hard to see now. <laughs> It is hard. It is hard. But I do. One of the things that one of the reasons I think I write about these things that happened a long time ago, World War Two and and now Korea is because um, it's kind of amazingly, thrillingly, comfortingly, you know, uh, just calming to think that at that point, Hundreds of thousands of people were dying in these these conflicts, and that, and now there's still people are dying, and still cities are being destroyed by drone bombings, for instance. But the death toll is not is not so great. So I, I mean, I guess that's the Steven Pinker argument that things are getting gradually a little better, and I have to hope that that's true, even though there are you know dips. Yeah. That the that the the trend is upward. Well, having the uh, you know having the worst uh, health crisis, uh, I guess in human history, it's going to end up being um, is uh, is uh, is makes it hard to be uh, the pathological optimist I often am. Uh, but uh, well, that's one reason why it has. We have to get to the bottom of it. Is this a human created thing, or is this something that some bat and some pangolin cooked up <laughs> when they met? In a bar, you know. I mean, well, let's find well, out. But either either one is human. I mean, the yeah. the way the the pangolins and bats were treated by humans allowed we it built to jump. The bar. <laughs> yeah, we <laughs> built the bar. bar. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, but I also want to I want to say, uh, uh, yes, baseless is your is your is your latest book. I absolutely love substitute, where you're a substitute teacher for a year and just report. Uh, you are able. Thank you. Thank uh, you are able to report and tell the truth slanted better than anyone I know. <laughs> uh, I read your books and I think, boy, he's just reporting. He really isn't editorializing at all. Then at the end of the book, God damn it, I'm thinking just like Nicholson Baker. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I, I did. Uh, well, that's very happy making to hear you say that. I mean, substitute was was really just to. to, to to find out what what kids are learning now and whether what they're learning makes any sense you know uh, my own son uh my my daughter did all the homework my son said this homework is ridiculous i'm not going to do it all and he ended up basically 
saying that he would be homeschooled, you know, and it was, and I wanted to find out. Was and he had and the administrators in our school made no sense. They were saying things that made no sense. So I just thought I would see what substitutes were being asked to teach, um, and a lot of it was Jesus was. I mean, a lot of a lot of what is on the in the curriculum is just simply ways of taking up people's time. I mean, it, you know, so much of it you could learn more efficiently watching YouTube, and the worksheets were painfully, painfully bad. But but the kids were so great. I mean, uh, I was uh, these are main schools, but these kids are not they're not necessarily you know, going to set the world on fire with, with their quantum mechanics or something. But they are, they were genuinely lovable people. And I, I was just sort of appalled at, at how much I liked the kids. And then I would have to hand these horrible worksheets out to them and they would just do them. They would just, you know, there was long strings of arithmetic or something. They just, okay, that's what they want me to do. I'll do it. You know, so and it just feels like mm, there's got to be a better way to to uh, deal with the, that much good nature than than what the school system was doing. You say in the middle of of crops being wiped out and people being made sick and all these covert operations, right. you then say the most troubling thing of all which is you might not be writing another book right away. You might be going into painting. Now, I know if you go into art, I'm <laughs> going to love it. But God damn it, you're not going to really stop writing books. Well, uh, isn't it? You know, uh, sometimes I think that every writer has, or every artist has a certain amount of time that they get, you know, an open mic night, the open mic night of history. And he's or she has come on and said some things. And then it's time to leave and let other people cavort and, and do their amazing things and, and just, you know, take it from there. And so, and I felt, I guess, I felt a kind of a, a wish to take, to, to take a break or to be, I guess, recharged. What I've been finding by doing, by drawing, um, just, you know, the, the, the effort to, draw someone's likeness is so difficult because the nostril has to be just right, the corners of the mouth, you can, you know, 30 seconds of an inch difference and somebody can suddenly have a sardonic expression and that they didn't have when in fact they're just smiling in a natural way. So all that drawing kind of thought I can have, and while I'm having it, there's other parts of my brain that are that are going and thinking about what I would actually like to write about. So it's a way of recharging. The, the drawing and painting is, is, is just a way of, of maybe Because you were about to find else. out how much we aren't pacifists if you were to <laughs> <laughs> you Write so or die. <laughs> <laughs> and also, don't it, the next 10 years for you involve Freedom of Information Act pages throwing up at your door every day. <laughs> yes, yeah. That's going to But be I mean, I'm, I'm, I just at 63, you know, you, you reach this point where you think, I'm, I'm, I'm old now. I, I done, I did this and I did that. And I, um, I feel like I got 20 years left. I, there's certain things I really want to know how to do that, that, uh, I, if I don't learn them now, I'll never, never learn them. That's why, you know, that's why it's probably why, Penn, you learn new a new trick or you decide you want to get into movies or you decide that you want to do this podcast or whatever because you're constantly thinking, well, look, 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 here's a new territory. I want to, you know, experiment. Well, and then that are, feeds back into the... You are welcome to learn all the new stuff you want. I just want your books to keep coming out. That's all. <laughs> and as long as your books keep coming out... You and I don't have a problem. <laughs> Once your well, books start co stop coming out, you and I are sworn enemies. <laughs> <laughs> Is that clear enough for you? I got that. I am on it. <laughs> I, 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 I'm, I'm, I got lots of notes for many years of, of um, note taking. I just, uh, 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 to those listening, I cannot, I cannot recommend your books uh, higher. I. Uh, I suppose if forced, 
I could rank them, but I think that if you just go and look up Nicholson Baker and buy any one of his books, you'll just be you'll just be pleased. My uh I, I, I like to read. I, I I read quite a bit, and there's no books I look more forward to. When it was announced that Baseless was coming out and Amazon sent us this little thing, I had texts <laughs> from like ten friends saying, Did you see this is coming out? And I said, I've already ordered it. Shut up. <laughs> We're done. I mean, you have um you have in my circle of friends just rabid fans who are willing to read anything you write, whether it is uh whether it is a downer and just uh, bums our shit, or whether it thrills us and makes us laugh out loud. You are just uh, an absolute treasure, Nicholson, and uh, thank you so much for being on our show. We just love you. Ben, I, I am thrilled to be on the show, and i also just happy to have gone through this slalom course of questioning from all of you, because it's, because it's a pleasure to be on it, and I, I'm, thank you. Just thanks. Thank you, and that was Penn Sunday School. That was Penn Sunday School. Cha cha cha. You become naked. Yeah, everything by Nicholson Baker, but certainly get baseless my search for secrets in the ruins of the Freedom of Information Act by Nicholson Baker. And if you want to go with good writers, the last name Baker is a really good one. Annie Baker writes the best plays. Nicholson Baker <laughs> writes the best books. The Bakers from New England have got it nailed. <laughs> and you know we love you. Well, I guess you got to feed those dogs there, Nicholson. Um, thank you so much for thank your time. You. And thank you for the great Gosh, books. Thank you, guys. It was really a pleasure and an honor. And I will look forward to further conversations at some point. In, informally, maybe. <laughs>